Um, all I can say is what an absolute delight to welcome you all in this beautiful neo-Gothic church of St. Barnabas in, in, in Soho for a mighty big if. My first My guest came to prominence in the early 1990s as one of the young British artists, the so-called YBAs. There was a tsunami of media interest provoked by um, an ambitious generation of artists with a flair for self-promotion and the ability to press the right buttons to trigger public or at least tabloid outrage. Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin, Jake and Dinos Chapman, Marcus Harvey, etc., etc. But my guest's thoughtful, visually striking work gained him a reputation as an artist who questioned the nature and the values of identity, of pop culture, and of art itself. His work has been included in many seminal exhibitions, including the groundbreaking Pop Life show at the Tate Modern, as well as the Venice Biennale, the 46th International Istanbul Biennale, Material Culture at the Haywood Gallery, Sensation at the uh, Royal Academy, and so on and so on. He is, of course, the mighty Gavin Turk. <laughs> I thought for a minute it was going to be the difficult Gavin Turk, and he was going to refuse to take the stage, but you're so beautifully lit, man. It's, it's made for it's you. What, the up light. Yeah. Yeah. It's good, isn't it? How's that mic? You... Is that good? It's good. It's, it's clear. Oh, too much. What are you going to do <coughs> Not yet. <laughs> that was you. That's me. <laughs> As you know, I'm known for being a man in total control of technology at all times, and this is no exception. Gavin, born in 1967 in Guildford, as I understand it. I love that, Guildford. Anything right. you want to deny so far? Yeah. No, no, it's no. true, but it does sort of haunt me. Well, it will. Um, Not I as mean, much I as some of the stuff I'm going to ask never, you. I never ever lived in Guildford, and it's just this, this town where I happen to be born, and it seems to accompany, for artists always get, um, when they get their name, they always get born in Guildford. Well, they don't always get, I get born in Guildford, they get born wherever they were born. But like, like that somehow that's significant to what you're about to see or to their name, it becomes but for us, inextricably linked to. I mean, there's something, there's so, I guess there's something about Guildford. I mean, I, I guess it sort of like puts me into this sort of strange, Home counties, no man's land. Yeah, yeah born in Guildford, it, that'll um, never work. It's certainly put you in the south oh, rather yeah. than in, in, in the north for a start. And yeah, there, there, yeah. there was a, a very critical yeah. divide. Yeah. Your father was a jeweller. So your father was a jeweller and your mother was a, a, a journalist for, for a while, is that right? For a while, yeah. Is this, <laughs> this is your life. Yeah. The red book. I've got them here tonight. Okay. <laughs> you thought you'd come here tonight, but. <laughs> is that right? Because this, I, I, this I was just thinking that maybe there this in microcosm we have it, this manipulation of, 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 I see, yeah. of text and beautiful things. I see where you're going with it. It's, ge right. it's, it's genetic, isn't it? It's all in there before I you see, even yeah. moved a muscle. Yeah. Maybe. No? You're not, you're not buying that? No. Okay. Maybe. It's going to be difficult, know. but don't worry. I'm not. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> um, just to get the, the, the biographical stuff out of the way, the famous story about... Gavin Turk, the first famous story about Gavin Turk, and there are many, is that um, your MA show at the Royal College, uh, you were refused a certificate for your MA because you exhibited a plaque that said, and if I can quote, you can tell me if this is wrong, Borough of Kensington, Gavin Turk, sculptor, worked here, 1989-1981. That's the story, is it true? 1989 high for 91 yeah, yeah that's right yeah and and why why did why did they refuse you an MA at that point um well that they, they said that I'd shown insufficient work of the standard required that was the sole piece you were showing um I showed the plaque in an otherwise empty studio oh. um but there's no such, there's no such thing as an empty studio, is there? I mean, that another was, one. <laughs> that, was, that was filling up the small well, I mean, available was, space. Empty, so. also, you know, plus that person in the room who was looking at the plaque at the time when they read it uh, um, uh, to make it not empty, um, quite empty, except for the plaque and them that was reading the plaque, unless they didn't go in the room. 
Um, in which case, um, they wouldn't have failed, really, did they? In, they would have known. No, no. They didn't go in there. But someone told them. Someone told them that it happened, and they couldn't bear to go in there. So they didn't go in there. So then it was empty and in what, their mind. What, 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 what it was, was it that really upset them? Did you know? Did you, um, did you ever have that talk with them subsequently? And, and it, it, the. I mean, I, this is a, this is in hindsight is a very kind of the, the, there is actually a kind of um, there is a kind of post as a sort of postscript which is and this may be, this may also be wrong as well but this is my story which is that Justin Stevens who was the rector of the Royal College um, had been awarded the head of English heritage the next for the, in the next year so he was about to leave the Royal College and he hadn't actually told people. Um, and he was going round the degree shows with his new friends from English Heritage, including various people from the Conservative government of the day. And they sort of said, Justin, what's this? And I think that Justin thought that I'd found out something about him and I was making some sort of comment about him. Um, mm. I would so have thought kind of that me of all the people in the world who would have loved a nice blue plaque on a building, it would have been Jocelyn Stevens of English Heritage, but clearly it didn't work in your favour. He, he was put in by Thatcher's government, wasn't he? To, I um, think he wants a blue plaque. It was to, certainly, to, there was to, certainly to, an element of Jefferson. He, he was put in basically by, by, by Thatcher's government, wasn't he, to make sure that um, art colleges became design colleges and applied art and, and, and colleges where you made useful things rather than decorative or theoretical or conceptual things. Um, I mean, certainly at that time, like the Royal College was very much a kind of experimental fee-paying school. I mean, it was the, basically the first college where they introduced the uh, the idea of the student loan yeah. um, for artists, um, which was which is a strange oxymoron. Um, but uh, yeah, because you come out of, you come out of your uh, degree after two years of hard work straight into a high powered job to pay your <laughs> debt um, still paying it off <laughs> yeah I mean tell me that um, there was there was uh, I mean there was a period there was a period on, I did spend a period on the dole yeah which was a, a kind of you know that was a, a strange sort of way of Earning, that's a earning money. That, that, that's, a that's, rite of passage. That's a rite of passage, yeah, though, isn't it? What, what, what artists were this But what, what did happen, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the legend here, whether or not this actually happened, you can either choose to embellish the legend or deny the legend, but the legend is that uh, you didn't get your MA, but a certain Jay Joplin did come along to that show and, and rather rate your work. I didn't see him at the time. I, 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 the only person that, that, that I did see was Rolf Harris, who came into the... It's the way Jane plays that wobble board. So he came into the studio um, and kind of like went, oh, and then went out again very quickly. <laughs> I didn't talk to him. But I didn't notice he popped, popped in, popped yeah. by. Well, when the two of you were in a room together, you and Rolf, one of those people was Britain's best loved artist. Do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> But, but you, I'm sorry, on J Jamie's so, Dream School, actually, yeah. the other day. You went on to be represented by Jay at White Cube. I did. And are you still? To no, I'm not. Uh, what went, uh, what happened? Uh, um, <laughs> no, well, we, we, we kind of, we got to a point, I suppose, where, um, where, he, he wasn't, didn't seem to be representing me properly and yeah. wasn't showing my work, so I, yeah. we just called it a day. Yeah, right. Is that and by, by that time, you'd been bought by um, the Sarches and so on. You were in, in, you were in major collections, weren't you, by then? You sure. Were, you, were, you, you, had, you, you had a presence and stuff. You made a, a, a number of um, sculptural... I mean, I also, I think the other thing was as well, that also, I, I did also like have a, um, various other galleries I was working with, so... Yeah. And we, who I still work with, so I was working with a gallery in New York and a gallery in Vienna and a gallery in Paris. So, so in a way, it, it, it kind of was possible to to kind of stop working with the gallery in London. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, Could we talk about that a bit? Because it's it's something I don't really understand. I'm sure not many people here understand the nuts and bolts of the gallery system. Here. Yeah. Is it a bit like? I mean, if I apply a, 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 a rock and roll uh, analogy to it. When you sign for a record company in London, that record company can then place you with a record company in America or in Japan or in Australia or wherever. Mm. They license you, basically. 
Is, is, is that a similar situation with the art world? If you sign with White Cube London, could Jay say, well, I'm represented by Larry Gagosian or whoever in, in New York or by... Mm, it could be, could be in that way. I mean, it, I've never ever signed anything All right. with anyone. I mean, that's the first thing. Um, but galleries do generally, like if you have what, what is referred to as a sort of, as a, as a, as a, a gallery that represents you, i.e. like a singular gallery, then maybe if you would show in a different gallery in another country, um, your gallery would want to take a percentage of your sales. Right. Um, I, I think it works very differently, and I think it works very differently to a lot of the other kind of, a lot of other industries like, like being a model or, or, or being, or being a, 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 an author. Or, mm. You know, I think there are lots of different kinds of ways that these things work. And I, I think that probably the gallery system has kind of worked its way down from a sort of, probably a sort of a patronage system um, where the patron then has sort of like been replaced historically with, mm. a, with a gallery. Um, I mean, it's, it is quite different, I think, to the music, the way the music, sy music system works. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that it... it I, I mean, I think also, like, it, yeah, it just sort of works out quite differently financially, mm. I suppose, because you're, you're making a lot less things and selling them for more money. Mm. Um, so the, the actual, the moment that the actual, the deal is struck is almost at the point of sale rather yeah, than yeah. at the point of deal, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I, you know, I think that there probably is lots of situations. I think, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're in a very sort of changing world, uh, sort of in communication terms at the moment. And I think also like lots of artists do make work which is more sort of available, and there probably are lots of ways. I mean, there are lots of ways, different ways that artists work as well. I mean, mm. obviously, there, there, are, there are artists that historically have, have done things where, you know, they maybe they've, they've charged people money to come and see their work. Mm. You know, they've, they've painted, you know, the, the, you know the, the universe and then charged people money to come and the see actual, their work. The actual manufacture of your work, the fabrication of your pieces, they're rather complex pieces. They, 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 they require quite a lot of a spend up front, and it, how does that work? Does, does, does a gallerist typically say, I will front up the money for you to have uh, a waxwork made or uh, uh, to, to have a series of prints made and framed, or do you, the artist, have to do all that? It's and such a technical conversation, it's quite good. Huh? So it's such a technical kind of conversation, but it's quite good. Um, yeah, I mean, it works differently in different situations. I mean, sometimes, um, I mean, and it probably works best if uh, I have a very kind of clear idea about what I'm proposing to do and I take that idea to someone and they say, yeah, I like that idea, I want to I help fund that idea. Yeah. You know, a bit like you would do a film. Um, but sometimes you have ideas and you don't really even have enough time to kind of get a proposal together and you just kind of make them and, and then, you know, you try and, you know, as much as possible, um, Get other people to pay as you go yeah. <laughs> if you can. Yeah. Um, sometimes you 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 know you you kind of you have a vague idea and the gallery wants to get involved in a project and they you know and make and they put some funds into to make that happen. So I mean I think it, you know it, it's again like it, it seems to be project by project. Yeah. Um, you you know, know I do, I do very different kinds of projects as well. Like they, you they, do. They, they, and that's they, what I want to do. I want, I want to talk about your work. Of course, that's what I want to talk about. Your um, probably the first, the first piece of work after your, your plaque that you became known for was the piece called Pop, which you did in 1993 or something. Mm -hmm. um, a life-size waxwork, self-portrait of Gavin Turk, in which you adopt the identity of Sid Vicious singing Frank Sinatra's My Way in the pose of Elvis Presley as depicted by Andy Warhol. Is that right? Sounds that sounds okay, doesn't it? I mean, blimey. <laughs> Pile up those cultural references, boy. <laughs> uh, let's un untangle that. What, what, what was the thought? Your, your, your work typically celebrates and, and explores uh, notions of authorship, 
yeah, I mean, identity I was, of our culture. I think, I think that you know the the kind of main thrust of the of the work was, I was trying to think about the idea of cultural activity um, as an artist making something like of kind of cultural import or cultural importance. Um, I looked at the idea of tourism um, of. Of, I looked at the Waxwork Museum, Madame Tussauds, and saw this to be like London's top tourist attraction. It was kind of, in a way, it was a kind of gateway to London. And, um, and thought, well, really, I want to get involved in this, uh, in this sort of waxwork experience. Also, it happens to involve a kind of, in a way, like a sort of lesser art form, that of the, the, um, the populist art form of the waxwork. Um, and, and I kind of... I found myself also putting that, sort of marrying that together with the idea of, um, of contemporary art or modern art even and looking at the way that modern art like returns always the audience to the, in a way, like the cult of the artist um, so, and essentially that might be reflected in the self-portrait. So I thought, well, I should do a self-portrait and then I, I kind of thought, well, again, like if we could bring that back into a kind of cultural framework, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll be um, a punk, um, and then I thought, well, what would a punk be? And I thought, well, will it probably be some, you know, some of them the Sex Pistols? What's the Sex Pistols? That's it, vicious. That's it, vicious. And sort of thing. And then suddenly I saw that he had his collar turned up. He had his hair spiked up. He had a gut. He had Nancy's garter on his leg. He had his sort of cowboy boots on. He was basically trying to be Elvis. <laughs> and then I recognised with a gun in his hand that actually like, and then the repetition of that seemed to be. Um, very much um, like brought out in the art world by Warhol's yeah. portrait of, of Elvis's gunslinger. So I was able to kind of um, involve and incorporate all these kind of um, things. And it, in a way, it was a sort of a set and series of sort of just compositional devices to, to, um, to, try and, um, to try and make something which just tapped into my interests. I mean, I, I think I was trying to make something that was surreal. You know, I was trying to make something that people might look at and go, I know who that, oh no, no I don't. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was kind of like something that felt um, that, that, that there was a sort of sense of recognition, that there was a sort of sense of um, engagement with, that you could recognize that maybe it was a figure, that you could recognize maybe the pose, you could recognize certain, strongly recognize certain elements in the work. Um, and then actually not, and then actually not. But that, that's something that you pursued. That's something you pursued throughout your your your, your work and life, isn't it? This idea that things with with your work are not what they seem. They're they're, they're very layered. Your 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 works quite often they're uh, very very much born out of an art historical reference, for example, or a pop cultural reference sometimes, but not art historical reference. So. You, a lot but of I your work is, is about the double take. Thing. You do that and you do that, and it's, yeah. it's not what it seems. It looks like it's Jean Paul Marat in the bath, but it's Gavin Turk as Jean Paul Marat in the bath. You reference everything from the French Revolution to, uh, to, to punk rock, and somehow make it your own, uh, attach your signature to it, to which you uh, uh, attach a great deal of importance because your signature is the imprimatur of authenticity, if you like. This is what makes it an yeah. artwork. Without the signature, it's, it's a lesser artwork, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, sometimes you could see the signature as a kind of defacement of the, of the work itself. I mean, obviously, if you've got um, two landscape portraits, two landscape pictures in front of you, and, and the artist has spent a long time depicting space within the landscape, one of them has this kind of mark in the corner, and that one is is kind of more valuable than the other one. Although, in many senses, the the the, um, the the mark in the corner ruptures the picture and stops you from being able to go down the mm -hmm. the, 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 the the space in the picture. Um, it's a kind of defacement. It's a kind of uh, it's a sort of a jeopardy. It's a sort of moment of jeopardy. Um, in a way, what it's saying is. Um, is that I authenticate this work, but the reason why you authenticate the work is because the work is obviously um, questionable as to whether it is um, a work by that person. Um, and then the, author, or the, the signature itself is obviously questionable itself as to whether the signature is a signature mm. of the artist themselves, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but then you've, you've, you've taken that even further where, uh, and, and made large scale pieces whereby 
your signature is actually the work itself. And, and you put a 20 meter signature on the wall and, and, and nothing but with, you know, lovely daubs of blue paint in a slightly heat kind, kind of. Kind of, yeah. I mean, the, the, the large, the piece that you're referring to was made out of um, a series of blue sponges on sort of sticks. Um, obviously, it probably wasn't my signature, it was probably more <laughs> Eve's Klein signature, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, I don't think I've, I mean, I haven't, I don't think I've quite yet literally just, just done my signature. There's always my signature. Attached to something that. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm working on it, I'm working on it. The controversial tag um, was applied to you and several other artists quite early. Did you, or do you set out to think this is going to rattle the bars of the cage a bit, or do you just think, actually, that whole controversy thing is so 20th century and I've so left it behind now. If people want to get upset about something, that's fine. But I'm not going out of my way to get a bit of a, a, a tabloid flash going. Um, I think you, I, I, you know, I think it, I think you want to make people think. I think you want to to try and stimulate something. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I don't, is, is I don't, I'm not, I'm not I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that I would ch chase after. Um, in, in a way, I, I, I make work about the, in a way, like the, the sort of. E ecliptic effects, if the sort of ecliptic effect of fame and celebrity, yeah. and, and in a way, like the mythologizing effect of, uh, in a way, of of, of 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 large artist signatures, and the way that they actually stop the audience from being able to to um, see through to to actually like what's being said, and to to in a way like the more subtle mm. elements of the work. Mm. Um, obviously, I. I continually come up against the problem that I, I was trying to, at, at some point I think, kind of make a critique of the artist's signature. Um, I was trying to question the value of the artist's signature. Um, and now, you know, seemingly if I sign a piece of paper it becomes valuable, yeah, which is almost yeah, yeah, the opposite yeah. of, 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 um, of what I was trying to do. Um, oh, so, so in a way I think that me, me, me sort of chasing this, this, um, this, this, Sense that you're, I think you're referring to. I think it, it probably ends up being being the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Is there still any sort of value in it? Do you think for an artist, and uh, a, a new artist, let's say, not yourself, is established and has has a reputation and is clearly not silly. Is there is there something to be uh, is there something to be gained from um, uh, making a sort of publicity splash in the, early on in your career? Do you think for an artist now? Why not? Yeah, okay. Um, artists of your generation have drawn a lot on popular culture, on a, on a very recent popular culture. You think of the, the uh, Chapman Brothers doing the Chapman Brother collection, or yourself doing punk rock, or, 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 or um, Andy Warhol, or Sarah Lucas you know, doing the humble kebab. Um, to a cynical British public who traditionally loathe anything sort of clever, clever, but even more than they like it, and to be clever, you know, but to be, to be clever, clever, is only an insult in Britain. Um, it, it smacks of trivia or of, or, or of um, silliness, it, 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 and elicits that, oh, I could have done that sort of response. Um, what's your view on that, on, on, on referen re referencing such recent art history, such recent popular culture? You know that we've not had any time to get any distance from and say, right, what's what's got value, what's got meaning, what's got purpose, what's got uh, integrity to it. Mm. Don't know. Um, that was a long question, and I'm not quite sure. Well, maybe you sort of half answered it as you think. Um, I mean, I I think I'm drawn to things you're not really supposed to do. I mean, there, there's sort of there, there, I I am kind of attracted to to ideas of things that you know aren't that good um, so one of the one of in a way like my kind of my bet noir is this idea of cliche um, you know as an artist you're really supposed to steer a wide berth of cliche um, 
And, uh, you know, I think there is a sort of idea that, um, you know, and it's still sustaining that, um, that art should be um, original and it should, um, it should be new. Um, and, uh, and yet I keep drawing myself round and sort of like um, being, in a, in a way, kind of guided by going to these sort of cliches. And um, in a way, I think it's partly because there, there's some sort of human truth within a cliche. And it's just a case of the fact is that, that it's attracted lots of people to that point to become a cliche because people know that there's something in there. And it's just a case of digging around. It's a bit like getting, the, getting a kind of a, um, a, a ball out of a kind of, like a rugby ball out of a kind of mall of, of people, yeah. like sort of seeing the ball and just kind of getting it out there. Yeah, but uh, um, Jack Kerouac, in one of his more lucid moments, said cliches are truisms and truisms happen to be true. And, and I think that's pretty much what you're saying there. All, all artists work to a lesser or greater degree is, is about themselves, isn't it? It's, I think, they get, I think that whether they like it or not, it gets returned back to themselves. Um, you know, I think that's the order of, I think that's the, that's the, 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 the orders under which, we, you know, or the, the, the terms under which artists work. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, that's, that's part of the contract you make as you make a piece of art, that you, that you already incorporate the idea of audience, the idea of um, this, bit, this thing being shown within a cultural space, which which is going to require, or, or the audience in some way, is going to find themselves um, coming to terms with the artist's mm. kind of uh, dialogues, or, or their, their, their conversations, or their, their thoughts, or their, their, what they like the look of, you know, their, their colour palette or something. Mm. Mm. Um, in a way, their, their dogma. Mm. I, I mean, I... I yeah, I, I think we, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe we're getting to a point like where we, where we'll move, where where things might move away from that. Yeah. Um, but, but I, but I think still, you know, we, we are in a point, we are at a point historically where, where art does, and is seen through the idea of it being a sort of series of, in a way, almost like artists' philosophies or artists' sort of thoughts. Yeah. Um, and and and, it, and I guess that kind of has happened, like from the I don't know probably from the sort of like mid nineteenth century. Yeah. You use yourself as your raw material in so much of your work, but mediated through either uh, a historical or a pop cultural figure, whether it's Sid Vicious, your put on a fright wig and your Andy Warhol, or your Jean Paul Marrow in the bath, or your Che Guevara, or you appropriate to some degree the, the, the stylistic uh, approach mm. of an Andy Warhol mm. or Duchamp or, or, or a Manzoni or a Joseph Boyce or whoever it is. And the artists that you tend to reference are artists who have uh, somehow built an artistic myth about themselves that is bigger than, than, than most run-of-the-mill artists, isn't it? Is it? Do you think that's... Um, uh, I think it's, it's by chance that you've, you've happened on those, or is that it something that It slightly comes back to sort of like my, my thoughts on cliché, I think, but, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that, that, you know, if I reference artists very directly, you know, it's almost to, to kind of, to be and not be, you know, mm. this, this kind of category of, of not being Andy Warhol, or not being... Um, or it not being a, a Manzoni work. I, I think there's a sort of very much a sort of sense of, of this sort of, um, this is not a dot dot dot. Mm. Um, mm. You know, th th there is that sort of inherent paradox, I think. I'm yeah. sort of like working within a kind of um, a very reflexive space where we are trying to, I suppose, I suppose in a way I'm trying to sort of like talk about truth, but obviously the moment you talk about truth, you, you need a you need a kind of framework to do it, and any framework that you build is obviously um, subject to the mechanisms of truth that you need to build the framework in order to put the mechanisms yeah. onto the framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we sort of like endlessly um, kind of spin back into into the frame within a frame. I mean, it's actually quite, a, I, th I think it's quite a sort of very 70s kind of notion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, and it, it, 
we, I, we, today we went round the Royal Academy British Art Show, or no, what's it called? British Sculpture right. Show at the Royal Academy, and it was it was quite interesting to see the the sort of the seventies room and the, the way the artists were kind of um, caught in that caught in that kind of conceptual loop where they were making work which was very self-consciously about making work which yeah. was very self-consciously. There's something that you said, I was, funny enough, I was just coming onto something like that. You said something that's really st stuck with me. You said in an interview once, there was at that time, and I think you were talking about the 70s, a lot of dialogue about the idea of art being over. And in effect, art from that moment on has been much more reflexive, much more aware of its own history. And then you go on to say, it's like you can't simply be a painter, you have to do something which a painter would do. Right. And I think that's really interesting. That's a, a sort of um, slightly existential but, problem, but it's, a, it's also a, a, yeah. the postmodern conundrum, but, isn't it? But it's also, but it, but it's also something that, 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 you, that is part of the, you, you know, you, you, as an artist, you have to actively incorporate those those values like as a painter you you know that every brush stroke that you put on the canvas almost belongs to or is is from the oeuvre of another artist and you also realize that your audience is able to understand in a way that the they're, un, they're able to understand that dialogue of brush strokes so you know when you lay the paint on in a certain kind of way um, or flick the paint on in a certain kind of way, immediately the audience is, you know, gets into a kind of a, a way of looking or a way of understanding what they're looking at because they're able to register um, the, 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 in a way, the minutiae. Yeah. Do you, there, think, there, do you, do you think your kind. audience is, is more sophisticated visually now than audiences have traditionally been, that they understand a vernacular better and that you only have to... Uh, uh, appropriate a certain gestural flick of a, 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 a brush of an artist and, and, and people understand all the references that is inherent in that and, um, can, and, and can move on to your work rather than see just the references. I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I, th I think, you know, that the audience is, you know, is always ultimately, you know, it's, it's very interesting to think about audience and who is, who is your audience. I mean, in some ways I could say that my audience is actually like, is kind of like a version of me who kind of walks into the gallery, only they're probably slightly cleverer, hopefully, um, and they love it, still. Um, but, it, no, I, I mean, I think that, um, no, I think that, that, that the audience, the, probably the audience in many ways moves with the time, and, and it is always as sophisticated as the time. Um, I think that, um, that, People, because of their just their human experience and their visual experience, and that could be just walking around in supermarkets. I think that they do have a very sophisticated yeah. visual experience, yeah. and I think that that does. Uh, um, it, it, it is there. I mean, it may be that people can't um, bring to mind; they can't recall why they know certain things. But I think that um, that people do do know certain things, and I think that there is. Sort of like there is a sort of like inherent understanding of, of of art, which which maybe people you know they can't go, leave the gallery and articulate, but uh, but I think that they they know it within themselves. Yeah, well, uh, Warhol is a case in point. Is it Warhol is a, an artist who came out of what we used to call graphic art, applied art, advertising basically, and uh, obviously made his splash in uh, what we call fine art, which was then appropriated back as a, a, a very knowing sort of uh, postmodernist reference into advertising again. This is not a Campbell soup can, this is a Campbell soup can as imagined by Andy Warhol, appropriated back into, um, in, in, into advertising or vodka or whatever it is that, that Warhol was doing. And we, the public, become so adept at, at dismantling these layers of meaning and symbolism, don't we, that we think, Oh, that's something that's referencing that, that's referencing that, that's referencing that. But all we need to know is that it's actually that. It's, it's, it's actually a pair of sneakers that he's selling. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do know what you mean. No, I mean, 
it, like I, I think that I think that um, just to be in the experience of in the you know to be have to have adverts forced down your throat, which when you live in an urban environment you do on a daily basis. Yeah. I think that you're continually getting. Um, I think you're continually getting informed by probably getting informed by, by things that have happened at some point earlier on in the fine art circumstance. I, I do think that, that fine art, you know, it, you know, in a lot of ways is a kind of high, and I, I sort of like it, it's, it is a kind of a, like elite art form in, in many senses, and a lot of people, um, you, you know, probably avoid it. Um, but, but I do think that it, do, it, that it does sort of enter into the, the food, ch the, the visual food chain, mm. and it does mm. actually filter down, it does actually affect you know, the way that adverts look and the way that packaging looks, street furniture is designed, um, you know, products are made. Yeah. And those things, you know, we, people come into contact with on a daily basis. And I think that, that you know, it, it, it's, I don't think that you should underestimate the, the actual importance of, of, of a, you know, of a, of a, and it could happen in, it could happen very quickly, but of a very good idea. Yeah, yeah. You, typically, not exclusively, but typically display your work in, in a way that gives a very hefty nod to a sort of Victorian or Edwardian way of exhibiting work, whether it's a, a vitrine, a plinth, a, a, mm -hmm. a plaque. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just tell us about, a, a bit about that? Obviously that's not something that, that mm -hmm. happens by chance, that's a, a, a decision made on, mm -hmm. on, on your part as as, as, as part of the whole realised work. Um, I think I just... Display, um, displaying work like that obviously confers a certain added value, doesn't it? It makes it an art object. Well, it kind of... Although, although the, the value is obviously this sort of like Edward and stuff <laughs> between them. I mean, which is, you know, maybe that's not necessarily the values we, we want, but... I mean, I think that I do sort of like generally like... Um, I make. I think I do make quite sort of traditional kind of art in a, in a way, and I think I. I don't. I, I mean, I. I very rarely make art that sort of plugs into the wall. Yeah. Um, I, I. I sort of try to. I think I try to make art using very, um, very kind of old-fashioned means, but maybe to try and make something that that can, you know, still carry <coughs> some sort of. Um, some sort of weight. Yeah. Sort of, I if mean, I, if I can get these pictures up of a show or, or an event, wasn't it? There's a performance that you had in your studio um, a little while ago. Where, like, um, you had how, how many of these uh, busts? We did these yourself? pictures. Was, like, oh, no, they're, they're like, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we were the Beastie Boys together. And then um, that's just before Gavin got his hair lit fixed. Um, Oh, this, this was quite fun. This is a project that um, David called to Gavin and myself. I look exactly the same like, in time. You do. Like, you look exactly the same. My way towards this. We had this brief. <laughs> we had this brief from David Albarn, who was doing uh, a, a, a Chinese opera called Monkey a couple of years ago. And he decided that um, he wanted an instrument built that would uh, mimic the sound of, of Shanghai and Beijing. And he decided that that, that instrument was uh, a, a trautophone or claxophone or something that was basically made up of sirens, hooters, uh, um, buzzers, all, all the sort of thing that you would get in the traffic jam in, um, in Shanghai or, 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 or in Beijing. Well, it's the sound of all the car horns going off, and like all but in space. Or all going off. Just always, all the exactly, day. Exactly. So David asked me to get involved. I said we've got to get Gavin involved, and so we started building this thing um, and, and sourcing these horns from the internet, from all over the world. And you, you could go online and say, what would that one sound like? And you'd go, beep, oh yeah, that sounds good. Like, beep, beep. But they never sounded like that. They never sounded like that. Never sounded and like that. also, they gave you no idea of the true volume. No. So <laughs> when you eventually built this thing in your studio, that was your drawing, lovely. That's you showing us what an air hooter would look like. Where That's the finished thing. That is the finished thing. But the amazing thing is 
but we couldn't actually play it because some of these things were actually foghorns, weren't they? And you were trying to... So loud. They were so loud, you could hear them from six miles away. <laughs> I had to and press air systems. You, you, would, you would push a button. In fact, we had ear protectors, look. Like, ear, protect, ear protectors. You would push a button and run for cover before the notes came out. We made it in LA. And, it's, uh, it's, it's really sunny, it. really sunny in the studio <laughs> that day. Open air. Uh, oh, hello. Cedric Christie took us on a drive to um, Basel. I put on a, a, a Ronnie Wood wig, and, and, and you didn't. Um, and all these cars were done up for the documentary, do you remember? We, we, we drove to Basel. Of course, we got as far as Bermondsey before we got lost. Um, and this is you when you came on. I'm always there. Like always this. there. It's like, Richard like, and it's me, is it? Uh, yeah, joined at the hip. Glastonbury. Uh, Gavin said, can I come on and just do one song with you? He came on second song and stayed for 45 minutes with green face, <laughs> shaking things all the way through my set. Yeah, can I, I come on with you? That wasn't the deal. He said, come on in there and it's lovely. What was lovely and warm? It was lovely and warm and yeah. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Any well, questions? It was going to be embarrassing to leave. I, 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 I cued the, the applause tape. We, and, couldn't, and we couldn't even play anything. We just had like shakers <laughs> like that in the background like that. But beautiful. We were just being supportive. It would have looked like we were like Look giving up. <laughs> Why would you need to play anything if you look like that? Can we just come on, man, and shake something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on about after 45 minutes. About four minutes, he said. Come on after four minutes, yeah. So there you are. Still an art. What? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's band. Like, his band's pretty good. Yeah, isn't it? There we go. They've so any the questions before while I show band, Mr. Turner? The rest of the band have been on. Yes. The doors, yes. Yes. Um, okay. In your uh, work, where you seem to adopt the roles of other artists or images or or inhabit um, the images uh, uh, that we've seen before, do you see yourself as a performer in that? That's the first question. And the second question is, where is the line between that and what, for example, an actor or a performer? might do. If, in case you didn't hear, the question was, when you uh, work in the style of another artist, do yourself as you're a performer, or do you see yourself as a performer in that work? And uh, a subsidiary question to that, where do you see the line between what you do and performance art? I think that's the... Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about performance art, I mean Performance, performance art which moves in to, for example, the role of an actor. Okay. Mm. So inhabiting the still image is actually saying, I am, okay, inhabiting this other thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, that for me, being, a, being a, an artist does incorporate a lot the idea of the perfor performance. I think that's also, I think for me also that's... Um, being audience is performance as well, like going into a gallery, walking into a gallery and looking at an artwork is a kind of performance. And I think that that's, that that's also incorporated and part of being an artist, I think, is, is a, it is a performance, I think. You know, it's, I don't, I, I don't, um, I, I, I do what I do, like I make my art for an audience and there is a sort of sense of some sort of like, um, kind of, I think it's a sort of some sort of cultural contract, a kind of performance. Um, how it fits into the idea of kind of acting, um, maybe. I mean, it, you know, like I, I, it, it, when you were talking, I thought very much of Cindy Sherman's photographs, where she kind of casts herself as these sort of film stills um, and kind of puts herself in these kind of mini films, if you like, of like sort of almost like photo documentation of stills from fi from films I, I think that, that there is a sort of, I think there is an element of that I think there is an, an element where where the place where I am at when I where, when I am when I exist within those artworks is a, a, a kind is a is a is a is an act it's not it's not essentially me I am somewhere else I am someone else you know it, I have myself um, photographed in the place of, or, or in a way, like um, as 
Che Guevara as depicted by Alberto Corda. Um, and it, in a way, it isn't really me. It's sort of like, it's, it's kind of like not Che Guevara um, and sort of not me. It's someone, so someone is, else. So is it a mask? And is it a mask that, it, that um, you might refer to as a... Um, it's an aspect of, of, of things you've absorbed through contemporary culture or whatever. Um, so, for example, Andy Warhol, Shane Bar, we see these days if you go down Carnaby Street, there are a lot of t-shirts. Yeah. Um, and by being on the t-shirts, in a way, I think they've lost their power. They've gained a particular kind of... of um, uh, of status, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the original, the original, which was. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, even important. the, but even the, but even the original um, was hijacked relatively early on by the Italian Communist Party and was used as a, a sort of emblem. And I mean, the original was never the original in terms. If we're talking about the Che Guevara image, I mean, it was an image that was hijacked. Um, you know, relatively early on in its in its existence, and it was used quite quickly f for other purposes, and 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 in a way, it's become a floating signifier. It's it's a it's an image that means something valuable and important, but different for different people for different reasons. Um, and it's just an enduring image. I think also one of the things about the image is it's so it's so durable, in as much as you could have. Um, a very, very worn out T-shirt, very kind of like broken down with hardly anything on it, and you still would know what it was, and it would still, in effect, do. In fact, the more deteriorated the image was, the more authentic it would feel, and the more it would feel real. And I think that that's one of the, one of the reasons why I, I sort of became so in, engaged with the image, is that it, it was an image that, that through deterioration, like um, became powerful and became strong and became vivid. Um, yeah. mm. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah, um, just well, two, yeah. but they're pretty trivial. Trivial, I think. Um, as um, as an artist, uh, if you um, if you look at art on a micro scale, is there anything that you is there something that you wouldn't that you wouldn't necessarily say is art? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. It, I'm not really that. I, I, to be honest, I don't really get very bothered, or I don't think too much about the category of what is art and what is not art. I think there were, I think that that I'm less interested in whether something makes it into the category of being art or not art. Um, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to accept anything as art. Um, I think that what's more important is is how successful it is as a, as a sort of artwork, mm -hmm. really. Um. Great. Um, and my second question to you is, <laughs> what annoys you the most in life? Very. This is a setup. Security, you aren't. <laughs> you aren't. Um, um, It depends. It depends. It, it, it changes. It depends on my mood. Um, so, can't answer that. <laughs> so, we're going to end there with Gerwin. I think, thank you so much for coming by. And it's been absolutely fascinating. We love your work. And long may you continue to make challenging and provocative images. And long may you be a bad boy of British art. So, Gavin Turk, thank you. Thanks, dear. Thank you. Thank you.